Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We will Amen. choose Amen. to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's Hallelujah. begin our worship by singing some songs unto our Lord. Bless the Lord with me. Bless the Lord with me. Don't leave us by ourselves up here because he's worthy to be praised. Put yes, your hands together. Come on. Hallelujah. Yes. Come on, clap, clap. Bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord with me. Everybody sing, y'all. Bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord, yeah. Bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord with me. Bless the Lord with me. Bless the Lord with me. Come on and bless the Lord. Bless the Lord with me. Oh, 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 oh. Bless the Lord with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, 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 oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to your name. never before. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let it rise.
is in this place, Lord Father, as we have worshiped you in spirit and in truth, as our hearts prepare, Lord Father, for the morning manna. We pray, Lord Father, that our worship will be acceptable in your sight. For all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, saints of God. We are here on a Monday morning, and we welcome you here to Pelk 2016. We're so glad that you have come out for this morning manna. Today, uh, the mantle has been placed upon uh, the manservant, Pastor Jason Ridley. Pastor Jason Ridley is a native of Richmond, Virginia, and he received his call to ministry at an early age. At the age of 13, he preached his first sermon. Pastor Ridley has uh, matriculated through uh, our schools, he attended Virginia Union University where he received his undergrad, and from there he went on to Andrews University where he received his Masters of Divinity. Pastor Ridley has been blessed to be preached all over the globe. He's preached in Canada, Bermuda, Thailand, Taiwan, Zambibi, and the Amazon in Peru, uh, Birmingham, and London, England. I, while he was in seminary, he was blessed to preach a three-week crusade in Uganda where 282 souls were baptized. Pastor Ridley is an emerging leader where he has the privilege to pastor uh, in Charleston, West Virginia, and currently he pastors at the Hilltop Community Worship Center in Columbus, Ohio. He also serves on the executive committee of both the Allegheny West and the Columbia Union uh, Conference. He also is a community activist and one who fights for social justice for all. And he's a member of two national organizations, the African American uh, Leadership Council, as well as MICA, uh, uh, which are both those who fight for the social justice and racial equality quality for all. But more than that, Pastor Ridley is a man of God. I've had the opportunity of working with him and serving with him, and he has proven to be one who is serious about the call that God has placed on his life. And so we know that today as we kick off uh, this day, this marathon of preaching that will take place today, the first leg will be run by God's man for this time, Pastor Jason Ridley. After the special music, the next voice you will hear will be that of the speaker of the hour.
Good morning. Giving honor to God and who is Savior and Lord of our lives. It's good to see your face in the place. It's good to see your smile in the aisle and your feet under the seat. God is good all the time, isn't he? Yes, he is. You know, there are some songs that have taken us through the first civil rights movement. I like to call it a going through song. And we're still going through it, amen? As Dr. King said, we have some difficult days ahead of us. But God has made a promise to us that he will not let more come upon us than we can handle. And so the song we've chosen to sing this morning, he knows, yes he knows, just how much he can bear. This song is on our remastered CD. If you didn't get one, please get one. You're gonna enjoy it. It's gonna lift you up. And get some for your cousins and your relatives. And because <laughs> Christmas is around the corner, amen. But he knows, God says, he won't put upon us more than we can bear. He knows just how much you can bear. Just 
I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord and worship. Anybody glad on this, early on this Monday morning to be in God's house? I thank Elder Savoy, his wife for beautiful rendition let's give them another hearty amen so thankful for your ministry they were honored on on last evening I want to thank the man who introduced me my mentor in ministry the man who brought me to Allegheny West Conference helped me to find a home and ministry there, Pastor uh, Jerome Hurst, pastor of the Southeast Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you for the blessing that you have been uh, in helping me to be where I am in ministry uh, today. I want to give a special thanks to uh, Dr. Wilson, and the Pelt Committee for extending me this opportunity today. I am, having not attended Oakwood, I am especially uh, grateful and humbled by this opportunity uh, to stand before you today. I want to acknowledge as well the pastor of this house, Dr. Carlton Bird who saw fit not to reject my name and to allow me to stand in his uh, pulpit. I thank uh, our chair, uh, Pastor William Joseph, who is our ministerial director uh, in Allegheny West Conference. He is also a member of my church, so uh, Sunday through Friday, He's my pastor, but on Sabbath, I'm his pastor. And I would be uh, remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, my bishop, my president, uh, Dr. William T. Cox. Uh, see our secretary, Pastor Marvin Brown, but I want to just give a special uh, word of acknowledgement for um, the blessing that you have been, uh, Dr. Cox, to my ministry in particularly, but more importantly, to, uh, for the blessing that you have been to Allegheny West uh, Conference and helping to turn our conference uh, around. And thank you for your leadership. That was uh, the devotion. <laughs> but there is a word. And I want to call your attention to a very familiar passage of Scripture. I'm going to ask that you would uh, stand with me as we go to the word, our theme is contend, contending together. Let's go to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, the 16th chapter. And we want to look at verse 25. And I want to call our attention to just the first six words of the verse, which simply said, and at midnight, 
Paul and Silas. And at midnight, Paul and Silas you may be seated in the presence of the Lord at this time. If you'd allow me to tag this text, I'd like to borrow the lyrics from the late great singer Ray Charles and we call it night time is the right time night time is the right time father in the name of Jesus we thank you for this moment God, you have been with me in my preparation. And I expect nothing less than you will be with me in my deliverance. May our eyes be upon you. Use me now as thy servant. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Let every lover of the risen Christ say amen. Amen and amen. Nighttime is the right time. There is a Zen Buddhist story of a monk who was fleeing from a hungry tiger. The monk was running for his life when he came to the edge of a cliff cutting off any hope of escape from the tiger. Fortunately for the monk, a vine happens to be growing over the edge. He grabs hold of it and begins to climb down the cliff out of the tiger's reach, who is by now glaring at him from above. But alas, as the monk is climbing down, he sees another tiger waiting for him below. Circling impatiently at the bottom of the cliff. Then to make matters worse, out of the corner of his eye, he notices a mouse on a ledge. Above him beginning to gnaw through the vine. Then out of the corner of his other eye, he sees a strawberry plant growing from a crack in the cliff face. This, my brothers and sisters, is what it looks like to be caught between a rock and a hard place. And is this not what it feels like to be in ministry sometimes when we're placed in undesirable situations, uncomfortable positions, tight spots, pressured with no way out, feeling that sometimes you can't win for losing. Many of you here today have pastored a lot longer than I have, but I've pastored long enough to be faced with the question in ministry where we have to ask ourselves, is all this worth it? Is all this pain and suffering worth it? Continuing to work hard and invest time and go the extra mile for people who oftentimes seem so unappreciative, is all this worth it? Because pastoring, though it can be very rewarding, yet it is extremely difficult. Several years ago, Fuller Institute of Church Growth did a survey of pastors and of people like, like us here today and listen to some of the results. 90% of pastors uh, work more than 46 hours a week. 80% believed that pastoral ministry affected their families negatively. 33% said that being in ministry was an outright hazard to their family. 
75% reported a significant stress-related crisis at least once in their ministry. 50% felt unable to meet the needs of the job. 90% felt they were inadequately trained to cope with ministry demands. 70% say they have a lower self-esteem now than when they started out in ministry. 40% reported a serious conflict with a parishioner at least once a month. And 70%, seven out of every 10, say they do not have someone they consider a close friend. How can we contend together? How can we contend if we don't at least have a friend? And I raise this question today because as I look at Paul and Silas being thrown in prison, this is one of those moments in ministry where it would be easy to ask yourself, is all this worth it? Uh, you are just trying to do ministry, but you end up being thrown in prison. Uh, is all this worth it? And uh, it's an easy opportunity to give up to check out. But that's not what we see with Paul and Silas because the text lets us know that in spite of their circumstances, they were singing and praying and praising God. And oftentimes, that's our shouting point in the text. But I suggest to you today that the key to this text is not the fact that they were singing and praying and praising God, but the key to this text is the fact that, that Paul and Silas were together uh, and because they were at midnight together uh, in the midst of their circumstances uh, is what ultimately prompted the singing, uh, prompted the praying and the praising God, uh, which set off a miraculous move of God in the prison house that night. And it all started because two men, better yet, two believers were together. And as a result, there are three points that I want to share with you this morning that their present predicament could not hinder. First off, their present predicament, their present circumstance, it could not hinder their picture of God. Understand today that Paul and Silas, though their reasons were vastly different, yet they had every reason under normal circumstances to be upset and angry at God because of the fact that they are now sitting in prison. Verse 6 lets us know that the Holy Spirit forbid them from preaching the word in Asia. Verse 7 then lets us know that they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit would not allow them, so they ended up in Troas. One theologian says that continuing into Asia made perfect sense. The Romans had established a string of colonies across present-day Turkey and linked them by an impressive highway system, and this would give the best access to the greatest number of people in the interior of the land, but God had other plans. And can I park here for just a moment? Anybody ever been faced with a but God had other plans moment in ministry? You wanted to be the pastor that finally moved that church into a new building. Uh, everything seemed to be coming together right on time, uh, but it all just seemed to fall apart at the last minute because God had other plans. Uh, you were passionate and dedicated about this new ministry you wanted to start to implement in the church, uh, It were, but it seemed like a great idea, but every time you tried to implement it, uh, it was just one fail after another because God had other plans. Uh, you felt like you should have been the one to get elected uh, to this position or that position uh, in the office, uh, but every time the session comes around, uh, your name is never called uh, because God had other plans. Uh, I'll say it again, sometimes God has other plans. 
Then the text says that they tried to then enter Bithynia, but again, the Lord blocked it. And it wasn't just once because Luke's use of the verb tense implies consistent, repeated attempts. They tried over and over and over again to enter Bithynia, but to no avail because the spirit would not allow it. So they ended up in Troas that night. And verse 9 and 10 says, and the vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Don't miss what's going on here. Paul desired to go somewhere else, but God did not allow it. And now here at nighttime, he receives a vision of a man from Macedonia asking them to come over and help them. And after this experience, everyone believed undoubtedly that, that it was not just a good idea to go there, but everyone believed that it was God's will for them to go preach in Macedonia. Now, Macedonia was a large Roman colony, but it did not have a synagogue. This is because either the city officials didn't want a Jewish house of prayer, or more likely the population did not include 10 Jewish men, the minimum requirement to establish one. Uh, nonetheless, this is why on the Sabbath day, uh, they went by the riverside and prayed and spoke to the women which were gathered there. And there was a certain woman named Lydia there who believed in God and heard the words of Paul. And as she heard, God opened her heart. And as a result, Lydia and her household were baptized. Around this time, a slave girl whose demon possessed enters the picture and after a few days of following Paul and company around crying out these men are the servants of the most high God which show unto us the way of salvation but after a few days Paul turns around and in the name of Jesus Christ commands the spirit to come out of her when her master saw that their source of income had dried up, was gone now because the evil spirit was cast out of her, they angrily brought Paul and Silas before the magistrate and accused them of troubling the city by teaching things that were not lawful for them to receive because they were Romans. And as a result, Paul and Silas were beaten and bloodied and thrown in prison. Paul who was just being obedient. He wanted to go somewhere else, but the spirit wouldn't allow him. But he didn't get disgruntled, and when the Lord sent him a vision of where to go, he didn't hesitate, but he went immediately, and the vision he had earlier was of a man crying out for help, but so far all he's helped is two women, Lydia and a demon-possessed girl, so it doesn't even seem like he's been able to do what he was sent there to do in the first place, but he is stayed faithful anyhow uh, yet his reward for obedience was a prison sentence he had every reason to be angry and upset with God he had every reason to have a pity party uh, confused over why this just happened to him uh, but it's not just Paul but Silas as well for his very own reasons yet he had every reason to be upset and angry with God 
You see, Silas was just a bystander. He had nothing to do with the demon-possessed girl being delivered. That was all Paul. And not to mention the fact that he wasn't even the only one there with Paul because uh, Luke says in verse 17, uh, speaking of the demon-possessed girl, that the same followed Paul and us, uh, indicating at the very least uh, that Luke was there with Paul and Silas uh, and probably others as well. Uh, but Silas, who had nothing to do uh, with the deliverance, and uh, he wasn't even the only one there with Paul, but yet he is the one arrested and he is the one dragged before the magistrates and he is the one beaten and bloodied and he is the one thrown in prison all because he was there in that moment and he was the one who was picked out of the group but let me just throw this in here because I don't believe that it was by accident that Silas was chosen. And uh, I know that we have some Silas here today. Uh, but maybe God allowed Silas uh, to be the one who was picked out of the group uh, to be thrown into prison with Paul. Uh, because maybe Silas uh, was the only one mature enough uh, to handle that prison moment. Uh, because you see, sometimes uh, what we're going through uh, is not a result result of anything uh, we did wrong uh, but sometimes it's simply uh, to be a support system uh, in solidarity uh, with another brother or sister in ministry uh, because we all need each other and that's what we find going on here they had every reason to have a pity party. They had every reason to be angry and upset, confused. Anybody ever been confused over why this just happened to them? And how much easier would it have been to give in to these negative feelings had Paul and Silas been alone and separated in this season? Listen, one of the main objectives of the adversary is to isolate us because it's so much easier for him to distort our picture of God. He's done a number on many of our parishioners. Uh, it's a continuing cycle. Uh, first comes a struggle in life, uh, followed by self-inflicted isolation. I don't want to go to church no more. I don't want to talk to the pastor. I don't want to talk to brothers and sisters in Christ. And now it's hard to break out of the cycle because their picture of God has become distorted. And now even though they are in a season where they need God the most, yet they are trying to be the farthest away from him. But the reality today is that it happens to us as ministers as well. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's only our employment uh, that keeps us coming uh, in some seasons of life. Uh, because spiritually, emotionally, uh, mentally, even physically, uh, we've allowed the enemy uh, to isolate us. And it has distorted our picture of God. But we find Paul and Silas together. And sometimes just having someone there with you makes all the difference. And verse 25 says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. They didn't get angry and upset, but they prayed and sang praises unto God. In other words, their present predicament could not hinder their picture of God. And what that means is that in spite of what had just happened, in spite of it all that had taken place and 
and uh, how they were wrongfully accused uh, and beaten uh, and thrown in prison uh, all while trying to be faithful uh, and obedient to God uh, yet in spite of it all uh, they still saw God uh, as someone who was still worthy uh, to be praised and worshipped uh, they still saw God uh, as the answer to their problem uh, they still saw God uh, as the one who is high and lifted up uh, the one who is omnipotent omniscient uh, and omnipresent uh, the one who could do something uh, about their circumstances uh, and that's why they prayed uh, because it did not hinder their picture of God And because their present predicament did not hinder their picture of God, as a result, secondly, it did not hinder their pursuit of God. That word pursuit does not mean a literal chasing after God, for God has not gone anywhere. We see evidence of this fact in Genesis where when Adam and Eve had sinned and they tried to then run and hide from God, but he comes looking for them in spite of their sin, in spite of their mistake. But more so the pursuit literally means a desire for God of being close to him in his presence. And that's why in spite of their present circumstances, we still see Paul and Silas worshiping because it created an atmosphere of being in God's presence. David understood this. That's why he declared that God inhabits. He, he dwells. He, he lives in the praises of his people. This is why David, after he fasted and prayed uh, all night, asking God to spare his child's life. But on the seventh day, the child died anyhow. But the word lets us know that David uh, immediately gets up from the ground and uh, washed, anointed himself and uh, changed his clothes and uh, went into the house of the Lord and worshiped all because David just like Paul and Silas desired to be in his presence and this is because in spite of it all they had the right picture of God which is always followed by our pursuit or desire for God Understand that when you see God as the one who loves you more than anyone else, uh, more than you could ever love yourself, uh, when you see God as your healer and sustainer, the, the healer and deliverer, the one who restores, uh, the one who is a problem solver, uh, who can turn any situation around, uh, when you see God as the comforter that he is, uh, who will comfort you in your dark moments of ministry uh, and and in life uh, when everyone else has kicked you to the curb uh, or too busy to be there for you uh, when you need them most uh, but God is still there when you see God as your sustainer the one who keeps you going uh, when you feel like giving up uh, when you want to throw in the towel uh, when you recognize that God has your best interest in mind uh, and only wants to give you peace and joy and happiness in life uh, when you understand that he wants to give you victory over every struggle, issue, and addiction stronghold in your life, when you know that he wants to break the chains in your life that keep you bound so that you can be free, when you recognize that the only reason you're qualified to preach this gospel is because he loved you so much that he gave up all of heaven, laid aside his divinity to come down to this earth uh, and die for you uh, when that's your picture of God when that's how you view him you can't help but want to pursue him your desire is to be with him 
Now, now, lions are my favorite animals. If I could raise one and I knew he would grow up and wouldn't eat me, I would do it. That's how much I love lions. And if you ever watch National Geographic, you'll see that lions are very calculated. And when they are on the prowl, ready to hunt, they will isolate the weaker and the younger of the herd to attack for the kill. Now the word says that the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You see, the devil understands the significance of having a distorted view of God. This is why in this great controversy that we live in, he has attacked God's character. And he tries to isolate us because he knows that if our picture or view of God is distorted, then that will hinder our pursuit of or desire for God, which then in return makes us more susceptible, even as pastors, to feelings of sadness and loneliness, feelings of anxiety and stress, feelings of discouragement. We're even more susceptible to temptation not to mention the fact that one study suggests uh, that some side effects of isolation is that it distorts uh, our logical and verbal reasoning. Look at Elijah. When he was all alone and on the run from Jezebel, but he begins to cry out to God that he is the only one left in all of Israel that still serves and worships God. But, but God just politely informs Elijah that I have 7,000 in Israel that have never once bowed down to Baal. There, it's so easy for isolation to distort our logical and verbal reasoning. There was a season in my own ministry where I was the only pastor from my conference, not in the city, but in a whole state. A whole state. And I can remember sometimes uh, during dark days uh, some of the irrational thoughts that I had because uh, I was left unto my own understanding uh, and it wasn't until uh, I would talk with friends or mentors uh, in ministry uh, that I would gain understanding uh, and perspective uh, and I'd realize that my situation uh, wasn't as bad as it seemed. You see, we must understand, brothers and sisters, today that none of us is an island unto ourselves. We were made for each other and for communion with God. As a matter of fact, I can almost guarantee that if we look back over our lives, that every time Satan has gotten the best of us, has snared us, is when we were not in close communion with one another or with God. But I'm so glad today that when I look at Paul and Silas' circumstances, that even though they were arrested and taken away from all of their friends uh, and other believers, yet uh, I'm thankful that the sovereignty of God uh, would not allow them uh, to be separated from each other. Uh, God's sovereignty uh, allowed them to be together uh, even in a place uh, where you are sent to be isolated. Uh, and as a result, they were able uh, to hold each other up uh, through their very own praise and worship, they were able to turn their eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth began to grow strangely dim. And the text says all this was happening at midnight. Preachers, you discover your theology at midnight. Until then, it's all theoretical. 
But when midnight comes, uh, you discover the difference between theory and reality. You see, midnight for Paul and Silas just didn't symbolize the fact uh, that time was changing uh, from p.m. to a.m. Uh, but it's sick. But for Paul and Silas, uh, it signified the fact that the odds were stacked against them. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about tomorrow. Uh, there was no end to their troubles in sight. Uh, for some of us here today, uh, midnight is when you're struggling to make ends meet on a path salary. Uh, midnight is when you seem to be reaching everyone else's children, uh, but your own children. Uh, midnight is when your marriage is the one crumbling apart. Uh, midnight is when you receive that bad report from the doctor. Uh, midnight is being stuck in a district uh, that won't cooperate uh, and just wants to block everything uh, you try to accomplish. Uh, somebody here this morning is stuck at midnight, uh, but I declare to you today uh, that midnight doesn't have to mean night night. It doesn't have to mean that it's over. But you just need somebody who will pray and praise their way through with you. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me just throw this in here. Sometimes nighttime is the right time. I know none of us here likes midnight. But every now and then, if you really think about it, some of the times you feel closest to God are at midnight after you've exhausted all measures and nothing has worked out and you realize that the only way you're going to make it is through God and God alone. Some of the best testimonies come at midnight. Some of the most powerful sermons are prepared in the midnight hour. One preacher said, when you really think about it, some of the sweetest songs of the Christian faith were composed in the darkness during midnight seasons. Fanny Crosby came down with a fever a few months after her birth that left her completely blind. But she later testified in life that with the loss of physical sight and moving around in darkness, that God turned a light on in her soul that though she was in darkness she sat down one day and she pinned the words blessed assurance Jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine heir of salvation purchase of God born of his spirit and washed in his blood this is my story and this is my song praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story and this is my song praising my Savior all the day long. And lastly, because there present predicament, their circumstance did not hinder their pursuit of God. As a result, it did not hinder their proclamation of God. One of the things that I've learned in ministry is that some of our best preaching is not what happens on Sabbath morning, but it's how we handle adversity. The text says, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed and the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do thyself no harm, for we all here. 
Let's deal with the other prisoners first. As Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, it says, and the prisoners heard them. Now, the implication in the original language is not that this was a casual overhearing. They just overheard the testimonies and the prayers but that the prisoners were actually listening intently. Then we see that after the earthquake and after all the prison doors were opened and all of the prisoners' bands were loosed, yet amazingly, all of the prisoners remained. I'm talking about hardened criminals, murderers, some on death row waiting to be executed, but they all stayed. Not one of them moved. And I believe it's because as they listened to Paul and Silas pray and sing praises unto God in spite of their circumstances that it had a profound impact upon them that for many of them for the very first time in life they were free not just from physical bondage but from spiritual bondage. You see there were prisoners in the jailhouse who needed Paul and Silas to sing. Their deliverance was tied to their voice, their singing, their praying. Understand that there are people in our congregations uh, who are in bondage, uh, who are captives, to, uh, to, who are prisoners to all kinds of sins uh, and issues in life, who need to hear a song from us, uh, who need our voice, uh, who need our prayers, uh, who need a word from the Lord from us, uh, and can we, like Paul and Silas, uh, in spite of our circumstances, uh, still give a word, still sing a praise, still pray with fervor? Are we connected with someone who will hold us accountable to the degree that come what may, the enemy will never be able to steal our voice? He can have our job. He can have our church. He can have our position. He can have our titles, but he cannot have our voice. But then there's the jailer. He's awakened by the earthquake. And all the commotion. Just to find all the prison doors open. And all of the prisoners' bands loosed. He just knew that the prisoners had escaped. So he's ready to take his own life because there was a Roman law that said if a guard lost a prisoner, he was given the same punishment they would have received. He pulls out his sword, ready to take his own life, but Paul cries out, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then the jailer rushed in and fell down before Paul and Silas and asked him, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Understand the implications of what's going on, but notice that the jailer didn't ask to be safe, but he asked to be saved. They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And the same night the Philippian jailer and his household were baptized in the name of Jesus. The jailer expected to lose his life, 
for loss of prisoners, but instead he gained life, true life in Christ, through the proclamation of Paul and Silas. You see, this is why Paul and Silas didn't leave the prison house that night when the prison doors flew open and when all the prisoners' bands were loosed, and it's because God's intent on this occasion was not the physical deliverance of his servants, but the spiritual deliverance deliverance of the jailer and his family. You see, you never know who God is trying to reach through your present predicament. That's why as ministers of the gospel, it's so important uh, that we have somebody in ministry. Uh, for Paul, it was Silas. Uh, and for Silas, it was Paul, uh, who's a confidant, uh, someone who keeps us on the up and up, uh, someone who won't let us check out uh, or throw in the towel, uh, someone who will stand in the gap with us, uh, who will go through the valley with us, uh, someone who will correct our foolishness, uh, Someone who will labor with us uh, all night long if they have to. Uh, someone uh, who will make sure our picture of God uh, is never distorted uh, because it will impact our pursuit of God, uh, which then hinders uh, our proclamation of God. But let me just say this. God has been too good to us to let somebody or some circumstance steal our voice. Listen, in spite of it all, God is always in control. You see, if Paul and Silas would have been able to go where they originally wanted to go, they would have never ended up in Macedonia. As a result, they never would have met the demon-possessed girl Paul delivered. Then they would have never been thrown in that prison. As a result, they probably would have never met the Philippian jailer, who as a result may have never surrendered his life to Christ. He and his household, they may have never been baptized. And when we understand it from this aspect, we understand that God is always in control, uh, even when our situation seems out of control, uh, even when our situation doesn't make any sense, but he's always in control. Uh, the reason we're surviving in ministry uh, is because God is still in control. Uh, the reason we haven't lost our minds uh, is because God is still in control. Uh, the reason we're still standing uh, even through prison experiences in life uh, is because God is still in control. Uh, the reason we can have a friend in ministry, uh, someone who can contend with us uh, and we can contend with uh, is because God is in control. And I'm through. But can we just celebrate the fact that God is still in control. The text says in verse 35, and when it was day, the magistrates sent the sergeants saying, let these men go. On the next day, after the Philippian jailer and his household were baptized, Paul and Silas we're set free. And I don't believe it was by coincidence, but I believe it was by design because they had fulfilled their divine assignment. And because God is always in control. And I wonder if I got a few folk here this morning who can celebrate the fact that your situation may not look good right now, but your own divine assignment and God is in control. As a matter of fact, he hasn't left you here by yourself, but if you know that God has surrounded you with some friends in ministry, 
who will stand with you, who will cry with you, who will pray with you, who will sing with you, who will praise with you, who will walk with you, even through the valley. You ought to praise God because he's always in control. As a matter of fact, can we just be obedient to the word and praise him together? You ought to find a friend and say, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You ought to find a friend and say, serve the Lord with gladness and let us come before his presence with singing. You ought to find a friend and say, let the redeemed of, of the Lord say so. You ought to find a friend and say, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, cause he's a God who's always in control. That's why when I think about my friends in ministry who stand with me, I can't help but think about what a friend we have in Jesus. He is a friend who sticks closer than any brother. What kind of man is this who will lay down his life for a friend? The songwriter says, they're not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows. Anybody glad that he knows? Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. He's the kind of friend who's always there. He's never too busy. He's always available. The psalmist says he's a God who never sleeps nor slumbers. Every time I need him, he's always there. Anytime I call him, he's right on time. Jesus, early in the morning. Jesus, in the midnight hour. He's always there. He's a God who walks with me through the valley. He's a God who leads me on up the mountain. He's a God who guides me over troubled water and he's a God who carries me uh, through sinking sand and he's a God who covers me uh, through the fire and he's a God who catches me uh, when I'm falling because he's a God who's always in control uh, and can I tell you about him uh, he's the Alpha and Omega the beginning and ending of all things. He's the bread of life, the one essential food that we need. He's the chief cornerstone. Come on, hold me, hold me, hold me. He's the chief cornerstone, a sure foundation for life. He's the high priest, a perfect sacrifice for our sins. He's Emmanuel, God with us, because he stands with us in all of life's circumstances. And he's the light of the world. He brings hope in the midst of darkness. And he's my savior. And he's the redeemer. That's why one Friday he was led up Golgotha's hill. They hung him high and they stretched him wide and he was nailed to an old rugged cross where he hung bled and died for your sins and for mine they laid him in a borrowed tomb and he laid there all night friday and he laid there all night saturday but early 
early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Yeah. And I don't know how you feel about him, but I know he's all right. The church said amen and amen. Would you all stand with me? Will you all stand with me as we pray? Father, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. He is that friend that sticketh closer than any brother. And because of that, God, we're going to have the right picture. And we will pursue you and we will proclaim your words. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everybody say today, amen and amen. <laughs> 